Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to a very special edition of the 51% a show about women reshaping our world. In this program, we're joined here in the studio by three extraordinary women, all of them Nobel Peace Prize winners. The three are in Paris to attend a conference on equal rights for women in the European Union, with all of them having dedicated their lives to ending conflict and improving human rights. The question I want to ask is, are women better peacemakers? Let me now introduce, firstly, Jodie Williams, who's been a driving force in an international campaign against landmines that's led to the signing of the Ottawa Convention by 161 nations, banning the use, sale and stockpiling of anti-personal landmines. She was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1997. Shereen Abadi, Iran's first woman judge who won the prize in 2003 for her work in promoting democracy and human rights, and Leima Gabawi, a Liberian peace activist who, with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and Tawa Cole Carmen, was awarded the prize in 2011 for her work in ending the Liberian Civil War. Thanks to all three of you for giving me some of your precious time. Jodie, I'm going to start with you. Conventional wisdom has it that if there were more women leaders, there would be fewer wars. So why are you such a rare group? Well, we're rare because we don't have the opportunity. Despite, for example, UN Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security, it is still very close to impossible to include women's participation in peace negotiations. Lema is a unique example and, you know, it was a grassroots effort. I, I think that until women actually have the opportunity on a regular basis um, to express part of the needs of society that are never discussed in a peace negotiation. I mean, I was involved in the wars in Central America and women's issues and societal issues were not discussed. It was about how do you separate the military. Women, I think, do have a tendency to come together in a different way than men. And I think I heard a very interesting thing on the National Public Radio the other day when I was driving to the airport to come here, and they were talking about in, in corporations and, you know, f of course, more men in power there just like everywhere else. And they had done some incredible studies that showed that men were willing to lie and do things that were against humanity in the advancement of their company, their corporation, whereas women were not. Women had a real struggle with that. So, you know, we let the audience decide. <laughs> okay. Shirin, what was most difficult, being an outspoken lawyer in Iran or being an outspoken woman? But we can I must say that my difficulty in Iran was uh, to have to deal with fundamentalists and people with extre extreme thoughts who think that they are the only people in the right mind. And unfortunately, this um, this is rooted in, t in the patriarchal thinking which is very present in the East. And this has always been my main problem as a woman, as a lawyer, and to have to deal with such thinking and to have to struggle against patriarchal culture in order to prove that truth is not what they think. Leima, the stro story that resonates the most about your struggle was when you were demanding the then President Charles Taylor and rebel warlords not to leave a room before reaching a peace agreement. You were surrounded by security personnel. You threatened to strip naked if they didn't reach an agreement. And that, of course, is uh, according to traditional beliefs, if you'd done something like that, there would have been a terrible curse upon those men present. 
Was that a spontaneous act? I would say it was a spontaneous act, but it was something that was driven deep from within my values and principles and everything that had been socialized to believe as a Liberian child and as an African. I grew up in a very um, closely knitted community. Maybe 12 of Liberian 16 ethnic groups lived in that community. I was a child of the community and they taught me the value for human life. They taught me the value for children. They taught me that children and women would be protected. And I had watched from 17 up until 31, all of those values erode. And then on that day, when we decide to stand up, even after all of the rape and abuse my sisters and I had gone through, some had been raped, going through the struggles of hunger and all of the effects of the war, you decide I'm going to stand up to right this very terrible wrong. And then they come and say you're obstructing justice. I told myself this is the last form of protest. People ask, so why did it why would it matter to a group of men who had raped and abused women that you were protesting to strip? And the one thing that I say and I'll continue to say to people is that it's a different thing when someone forces you to strip. And it's a totally different thing when you decide the last shred of my dignity, I would give away to you in protest. What, what were the look on their faces when you issued that threat? Well, first, the security officers who were going to arrest me ran away. <laughs> I don't know what they fear. <laughs> but the other thing was that later on, one of the warlords confessed that as they sat in that room, the one thing that came to his mind was, wow, what have we done? to bring our mothers to this place where they would disgrace themselves. Jody, given what Lamer's just said, mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's something about that which is an extraordinary creative tactic mm -hmm. on Lamer's part to basically diffuse the situation. Is that something that women are, are more capable of doing? I, 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 it's hard to answer. Um, given my own nature, I'm not a diffuser. I happen to be more confrontational, more an in agitator? your face. An agitator, would you describe yourself as? As what? An agitator, in that sense? Oh, I'm a grassroots activist through and through, and I believe fundamentally in the right of ordinary people to be part of this world, and that not sitting back and waiting for the powers that be to decide our fate. And I think that's a common thing of the three of us and the other women recipients of the Peace Prize. We don't wait. I don't, I mean, I care I'm a woman, I've never wanted to be a man, but I am a human being and I will go forth in the world and I will push for what I believe on behalf of others who can't speak as, you know, forcefully and let the, the things happen as they I, should. I just, I just want to ask you because, you know, the, we all remember that iconic image of Princess Diana mm -hmm. walking through the cleared minefield. Mm -hmm in Angola, but you've been campaigning for many years beforehand. Mm -hmm. At what point did you reach the tipping point in terms of realising that your argument was being heard by the right people and listened to? Well, I just, I have been an activist since the Vietnam War. My first protest was in 1970 and when I was at the University of Vermont. And then I worked for 11 years in the wars in Central America, primarily El Salvador and Nicaragua, trying to stop U.S. military intervention, which is always a challenge through the ages. And then I was asked to create the landmine campaign. And the tipping point really was when, because when I first started, it was two organizations and me. And I went to the UN because it was economically sound. All the governments were there and you could start talking to them. And I remember my first meetings with governments and it was like, go home, little girl. Why are you nuts, you know? Why should we listen to you? This is a weapon that's legal, blah, blah, blah. But when governments started to feel the pressure as the campaign grew to 1,300 organizations, and they started to realize that we were changing the conversation, that we were, we were forcing them to do what they should have done anyway, that they began to take steps, and they began on their own to take national steps that were the building blocks of the treaty. Shirin, when you listen to what uh, Jody was just saying, is it harder for women to be taken more seriously than men when it comes to promoting awareness of complex, difficult issues? 
فرهنگ پدر سالار That again goes back to patriarchal tradition. Yes, women are less taken seriously, so they have always to prove their skills and they have to hard work her to prove their legitimacy. If you uh, see a famous woman in the world and you compare them with men who've had similar careers, you see that women have always had to struggle more and to prove that they deserve what they go through. And as we're talking about landmines, I wish to tell you here the story of my first meeting with Jody. It was when I had just received the Nobel Prize and I had already been active in Iran about landmines because Iran happens to be the second country in the world in which there are still landmines, but they never let it know, they never let anybody know. And international media then mentioned this fact about Iranian territory. And Jody knew that I was active about landmines. I was in France and she called me and we had a conversation together. I want to ask you something. If we uh, had as much power as men and as much sense of self-entitlement would be would it be different would we be as mendacious and warrior like i doubt it would if it would be usually when people ask me are women better peacemakers or better leaders i say no one is better because we all possess good and evil in us what distinguishes one from the other is how you um translate or bring it out mm -hmm. so we all carry a lot of anger and we can decide I'm going to use violence as a means of expressing my anger or I'm going to use non-violence. The difference that women and women have when it comes to being a leader and a peacemaker is that we're more taught for. Put us on the peace table, we consider those who are hungry, we consider those who are internally displaced, and put a vast majority of the men on the peace table and they're concerned about their jobs, and the, 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 the natural resources and all of the different things. So I don't think if we had power, we would be flaunting it rather. Mm -hmm. I think if we had more women leaders in, we'll have a better situation of social and uh, human security, mm -hmm. and which would really translate into lesser conflict and, 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 and more stable societies. In terms of political representation and participation, what is stopping women from reaching those senior levels? Politics and, 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 and political interaction is still a male domain. Who has the money in Africa in order for you to go or anywhere in order for you to be a politician? Mm -hmm. You must have the resources. You must have the contact. We call it the boys, the, the, the old boys network. Mm -hmm. The politics in Africa is still about who's the godfather of this political party or who's the godfather of this financial institution. Mm -hmm. And most often, because they understand that women will be more hesitant to go with some of the tricks after being elected, they would rather select men to put, put their money on and to do other things. So it's, it's really a complicated case. But for me, I'm never a pessimist. I'm an optimist because one of the things I say, like this country, 70 years ago, women could not vote. Today, you have women voting. So I know that when it comes to my daughter's generation, politics would be an easy thing for them to Things delve into. Things will be into. different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for instance, in Iran, Shirin, you've got a new man in charge. Have things improved in your country? Since um, the elections took place, Iranian people were very optimistic, hoping that after Ahmadinejad there were going to be reforms through this new president. But unfortunately, nothing has changed in reality, and people lost their hope. And since Mr. Rouhani has been in power, if we just take this period and compare it to previous years, we see that that penalty has been applied more since he's been in charge. 
Many newspapers have been forbidden. Many social activists and human rights activists have been put in jail. We still have political prisoners. And I must say that I'm sorry to, to say that nothing has changed. How much leverage has it given you having won a Nobel Peace Prize and have you used it to help other women? Yes, it has given, I think, all of us leverage, obviously. Um, I had a very hard time at first with it. I'm an introvert by nature. You have to develop a public persona, um, especially as an introvert, it was hard. When I really came to enjoy it personally, because I knew what it did for the landmine campaign, obviously, because it went to me and the campaign, it really raised the stature even more of civil society coming together to pressure governments for change. But when I really came to love having the Peace Prize was when the Nobel Women's Initiative was formed. And Shirin had mentioned that we met up in uh, Nairobi at a conference. It was there that we were talking and she said, Jody, seven women today are alive who got the Peace Prize, we should do something. And it was at that point that we decided we'd talk to Wangari Matai the next day, she had just been named, and see if, it would, if we wanted to come together and use the influence and access that we as women laureates have to support the work of women's organizations around the world working for sustainable peace with justice and equality. And ever since then, I just feel like I'm sharing this thing with women all over the world, and I'm very happy about that. Thank you, Shirin, for that. <laughs> And at that point, I'm afraid to say, we have sadly run out of time, but I suspect the conversation will continue beyond the studio. I really want to thank my guests, Jody Williams, Leima Gabawi, and Shireen Nibadi for giving me some of your precious time. That's it for now. If you would like to comment on what you've just seen, please head to our Facebook page, franzbankat slash the 51%, or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. Thanks for your feedback so far. Please keep those comments rolling in. Until our next program, bye for now. <laughs>